More than 90% of people worldwide live in areas that exceed healthy air quality guidelines. The list of health problems and fatalities as a direct result of air pollution is growing year on year. Which leads us to the question, how clean is the air we breathe? So let's start with the basics. Ambient air pollution comes in a number of different forms. Some types are produced naturally, entering the atmosphere from volcanoes, forest fires and dust storms, but the majority of what affects our health is human-made pollution. Burning fossil fuels, vehicle exhaust emissions, power plants and agricultural activities like crop burning and the use of chemical fertilisers. So why should we be concerned? A 2017 report from the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation established that air pollution is the fifth highest death risk factor posed to humans of all ages and genders globally. Directly linked with the estimated deaths of more than 7 million people worldwide every year. But how is air pollution affecting our health? When we breathe in polluted air, the various pollutants go inside our lungs. You can broadly divide these pollutants into two categories, the particulate matter and the gaseous matter. One of the components of outdoor or ambient air pollution is PM2.5, particulate matter measuring less than 2.5 micrometers in diameter. Now for context, one single strand of human hair has an average diameter of 70 micrometers. Now we breathe 25,000 times every day. So imagine even if a small fraction is getting inside in each breath. Lung is the port of entry, but that's not the only damage organ. From lungs, it gets absorbed, it goes to brain, it goes to heart. Every organ which gets blood gets its supply of toxins as well. If you take the risk study from earlier and isolate it to children under the age of five, pollution moves from being the fifth highest death risk to third, second for children aged five to 14. In terms of damage to the body and lungs, 22 microgram of PM2.5 is equal to one cigarette smoke. And in most of the Indian cities, there is no non-smoker because our PM2.5 levels most of the times are upwards of 200. And there are occasions where it goes to 300, 400, 500, it even crosses 1000. And that air, mind you, is inhaled by everybody from a newborn born in that city to the elderly person living in that city. So that's why I make a statement that we are a country which presents a pack of cigarettes to its newborns on the very first day of their life. The World Health Organization state that long-term exposure for those living above an annual average PM2.5 concentration of 10 micrograms per cubic meter are at higher risk to mortality. Now, based on this criteria and current global PM2.5 concentrations, more than 90% of the world population is exposed to unhealthy air with developing countries like India and Bangladesh having an average concentration eight times higher than the clean air guidelines. The threat to health has been known for over half a century. On April 22nd, 1970, millions of Americans took to the streets in the first ever Earth Day to protest against the impact of decades of environmental damage and industrial pollution. As a result, by the end of 1970 in the US, the Environmental Protection Act was founded, as well as a Clean Air Act amendment. Each of us all across this great land has a stake in maintaining and improving environmental quality. Clean air and clean water. It is literally now or never. But 50 years on, and although average air quality may have improved on 1970 standards, we're still seeing the number of deaths as a result of air pollution increase year on year. And especially in the developing world, where rapidly growing economy demands more energy, with nations looking to fossil fuels as a quick way to meet these demands. So what needs to happen? As concerns grow, there are a variety of different initiatives being applied across the globe. From educational programs about the dangers of pollution and support to move away from pollution heavy practices, ultra low emission driving zones in cities like London, to government backed incentives that encourage the adoption of electric cars and clean energy. We don't have to spread our action taking those small one a step, two a step kind of approach. We just have to leap forward because there's enough lessons around the world. What we are going to do over the next five years is either going to make it or break it. 
Tech innovations are also likely to play a growing role in how we monitor air quality globally and tackle urban pollution. Citywide monitoring systems like these in Seoul, South Korea, can provide local governments information on air quality levels around the city and help to inform decisions on traffic restrictions and improving public health. Smog capturing devices like this one in China that uses ionization technology to produce smog-free air in public spaces, and anti-pollution paint that can be used on the outside of urban buildings to absorb the same amount of pollution as a 30-tree forest. As forward-thinking and useful as these innovations are, the majority of the change needed will come down to adapting the practices of everyday life. One of these changes being with the type of cars we drive. Out of the five most prominent sources of air pollution, vehicle exhaust emissions contribute to four of them. A switch to electric cars requires rapid development and infrastructure. In the past, changes like this have looked to other industries. And the biggest development ground and advert for the cars we drive since the start of the 20th century has been motorsport. Many of the features and devices that are common in cars around the world today came from racing, seat belts, disc brakes, the rear view mirror, and now in the new age of transport, Formula E is providing that space for the development of electric vehicles, showcasing their ability to perform and accelerate the switch to electric vehicles. Some of the world's biggest car manufacturers make up the Formula E grid, and since its inception in 2014, the data and developments that have come from the sport have already found themselves in the cars we drive on the road improving the range of electric cars, the battery capabilities, and the charge time. Racing predominantly on street circuits in the heart of the cities has an added benefit, aside from bringing motorsport closer to fans. An air quality assessment taken from the Paris e in 2018, measuring particulate matter, showed that air pollution was reduced by two thirds on the site and city streets of the event, thanks to the reduction in petrol and diesel powered vehicles on the roads and Formula E's initiative to encourage fans to use public transport by not providing parking on site. The devastating COVID-19 pandemic and corresponding lockdown has simultaneously allowed us a shimmer of hope for the future when it comes to the air we breathe. A 75% drop in PM 2.5 levels in Delhi and toxic emissions at major roads reduced by 50% in London shows the impact that changes to our everyday lives can have on environmental issues. Air pollution poses a serious threat to our health around the world. The facts are known, and more importantly, the solutions are already available. Formula E believes in a future where every car is powered by clean, renewable energy, with exhaust emissions and fossil fuel use consigned to the pages of history books. And all of us, young or old, rich or poor, breathing cleaner air.